Tonight we have James Pan, who will be uh, the guest lecturer here, and he's been uh, in this classroom many times over the last several years, or a few years. Uh, so he's a friend of the Ramsey Student Investment Fund. Uh, I'll let him go into his investment style and process and record, uh, but just to give you a quick heads up, Mr. Pan has been an investor on his own now for a decade and a half, uh, plus has a fantastic track record uh, that would uh, be the envy of any money manager. I'll let him get into that. Uh, but uh, he is a, has a value bend, but certainly he'll explain his own philosophy. And with that, uh, Mr. Pan. Uh, thanks, uh, Rodney, and I want to thank uh, Steve for inviting me. Um, this is just a totally open forum. I have no prepared lecture. Uh, so just any questions you have about you know, making money or investments, I'll, I'll gladly try to answer to the best of my ability. Uh, but just to start, I just wanted to uh, put out the numbers. I gave you guys a handout. And my 15th year anniversary, the first trade for my fund, uh, was on September, uh, October 1st, so just a couple of weeks ago. So it's been 15 years since I started the fund. Now, for the first 13 and a half of those years, I was managing um, a, a hedge fund that charged fees. And then for the last 18 months, I, I, uh, I uh, returned all the outside capital and, and only managed money for my family and, and relinquished the fee because it didn't make any sense to charge my family a fee and then get taxed on it and all that fun stuff. Um, but there are several things I want you to notice here. There, I, I try to benchmark myself against all these different as asset categories, uh, including some very good short sellers, uh, Money markets, uh, the consumer price index, the, a very well known um, uh, mutual fund called Fidelity Magellan, the S&P 500, Ver, uh, Vanguard fund, uh, something that is 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 uh, proprietary or something I made up is called the Big Mac index. Every year I call a McDonald's in Vienna, Virginia, the same McDonald's, and ask them how much a Big Mac value, regular Big Mac value meal costs with tax. So we have that record for the last 15 years. Uh, you know, PIMCO Total Returns, Bill uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and a long bond fund called American Century. And you'll see returns to my partners to 20%, 10% returns. Those are different classes of partners. And my, the GP is me. That, those are returns to me pre-fee. Uh, obviously, I don't charge myself a fee. And the reason I do this is because I want to see if I should exist. Uh, I benchmark myself uh, and, um, and to see if I exist. And a couple things you should notice here. You'll see the CPI over 15 years is up around 2.3% per year. But you notice the Big Mac index, which is just food basically, is up at 5.5% uh, a year. So there's a mismatch between you know, what people buy and, and the CPI. And so you, know, you could speculate it's because of uh, technology, smartphones improve our lives, iPads, tablets improve our lives. But you know, stuff that you're really buying out there, um, like food, is going up. Uh, maybe some other things are going down, like like uh, rent. I guess with the housing crisis, that was, was probably is definitely over by now. But certainly stuff like tuition has gone up and, and things. <laughs> so a lot of things have gone up. So there's, there's a bit bit of a mismatch there. Um, and so yeah, so I just wanted to know if I exist. I, if you look at the record, I I was talking to uh, Steve earlier today. I don't think um, there are a lot of lot of money managers with the type of record you see there. And, and the thing about it is I'm a one-man shop, so you can do it on your own. It's not that complicated. So you want to hand up? So we're going to open up to questions. Any questions you have about making money, about career, I'll, uh, I'll try to answer. And also there's other handouts in there. It's just you can read that. Um, uh, and, and if you have any questions from those, you know, what I wrote down there. Um, uh, feel free to ask, but the, you know the process is, is, is pretty simple to uh, The process that I use is, is pretty simple. There's only a couple steps actually five steps to figure out whether you should invest or not So so go ahead. There are some questions. Yes in the back are these returns net of your transaction fees? Uh, net of, yeah, net of, net, net of my transaction fees. Transaction fees are, are really small. They're five or five cents uh, The commission I pay I pay a little higher than what you would Pay on TD Ameritrade because they they keep all my securities. I do some a little bit more complex stuff than you can just do at Charles Schwab or something like that. So instead of paying eight dollars a trade, I'm paying a nickel a share. But they're letting me hedge my currency. They're letting me do swaps and other other a little bit more complex stuff. Yes. Can you go into the five steps? Yes. Okay. So so 
when you're at uh, pay, paying a lot of money for your MBA, and I know you guys pay a lot of money, how do they define risk uh, in your class? Do they make you, you know, drive beta, something called alpha, sharp? They don't? I mean, we've done that. That's not in this class. That is what we call risk. Right. Well, yeah, okay. That's, that's very good. That's, good, a, that's, good. A good. that's the right answer. Because, you know, the, 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 the risk is not some Greek letter. He gets a candy. Oh, here you go. Candy. Especially for answering. Ah, sorry. <laughs> right, right. There you go. Ah, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, but, um, but, but risk, if, 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 if you're, if, you're, if you need your capital in a short period of time, like less than a year, then the volatility of the price of that asset, whether it's stock market or a house or whatever, then you can define risk as the volatility of price. And that's how most of the industry does it. They define risk by the volatility of the asset, the, vol the price volatility of the asset. But as you go further out on time, score, time, time scale, so if, if, if you go out three to five years, then your risk and you don't have a call on your money, then your risk is really three things. One, is, is, this, a, is this business going to be here in three to five years? If you look at businesses that become obsolete, like the Encyclopedia, Kodak, and things like that, you, it doesn't matter what price you bought that at, it was a bad investment. The same thing could be said, Washington Post. When I bought the Washington Post in 2005, Newsweek was making $50 million a year. In 2011, I think they sold it for a buck. And in 2013, it's now gone, not even existing. They can't even make money online on it. So um, the other way of losing money is your, your weak money. your leveraged, you borrowed money. And I'll give you an example. Citibank, and I, I'm making these numbers up, but they're, they're ballpark at the right. In 2005, Citibank was making 20 to $22 billion a year. This year, they're making 20 to $22 billion a year. So, so, so the difference between 2005 and 2000. 2013 is that there are six or seven times more shares out there now than there was in 2005 because they kept they needed to keep on reintroduce they needed to keep on um, uh, issuing shares to fill up their capital base uh, and and therefore those guys will never make those guys who kept their shares in 2005 and held on to it now will never make back their money because Citibank's never going to make 140 billion dollars a year okay so that's the second way of losing money uh, the third way is you just buy too high of a price. In 2000, you could have bought Cisco, Microsoft, Oracle, uh, Intel, and they are all marvelous businesses. And in the last 13 years, they performed wonderfully. They've, hit, they've you know, some of them don't grow as much as before. Uh, um, don't grow at all, actually. But, but if you bought Cisco in 2000 at 50 bucks, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very hard to make back your money. Uh, so if you could buy a great business, but you can pay too high of a price. And that's the third way of losing money. So if you could figure out, when you look at a stock, if you could just say, well, I'm not going to do those three things, you've eliminated a lot of your risk. Now, sometimes you make mistakes. Your, your judgment about the quality of business, like the post, was a mistake I made, or for-profit education, which is a mistake I made in terms of how good of a business that was. Um, but, that, but if you do that enough times, and if you just approach it, you know, how can I lose, when you look at a stock, how can I lose money on this investment? And you figure, well, it doesn't fit those three, and you think it's a good business, then then you've you've taken out a large part of your risk. I mean, Warren Buffett says, first rule of making money is don't lose it, and the second and the second rule is don't forget the rule number one, right? <laughs> you know, and you know, in in, in in picking stocks or assets or whatever you're going to do, yeah. there are a thousand different ways to make money. You could be a, a a day trader, a momentum player, a venture capitalist, an LBO guy. A value investor, a growth investor, guard. they're all, this, you know, you can, you can make money in any discipline whatsoever. The one thing they have all in common, the, the successful ones, the ones that last decades, like, you know, Warren Buffett, there's one guy out there who knows how to day trade and all that kind of stuff. I don't know who he is, but I'm sure he's lasted 20, 20 years. They all know how to manage their risk. That's the one common thing among all those guys. And they might do it differently, but they all know that's, that's the one common trait they all have. They all know how to manage their risk. But um, in terms of flipping that around, there are only really two ways to, I'm not talking about the day, day trading, like you buy something at 20 and sell it at 21 the next day. Um, in, in the long run, again, the longer you go out on the time scale, the two ways to make money is the, the businesses themselves make money. Like 
Uh, I own WellPoint, okay, and I think next year they said they might make eight bucks. WellPoint is the biggest Blue Cross Blue Shield publicly traded uh, health insurance company. Um, and so they said they're going to make it, they might make eight bucks in 2014. So I own at 86 bucks, so theoretically I'm going to get eight bucks, you know, in something, maybe a dividend, maybe price appreciation, maybe debt down payment. So something I'm going to get eight dollars of value there. But the real money is going to be made is if Instead of pay, so that's a that's a 11 PE or 10 10.8 PE. I'll get paid the real money when that PE goes from 10.8 to like 12 or 13. So you get the multiple expansion on the same earnings. That's where the big money is made. So you make a little bit of money on the actual, uh, uh, you know, the actual earnings of the business. But you make the big money on the multiple expansion from going from you're buying something at 10 times earnings and you're trying to sell it. Hopefully an average business and you're trying to sell it at 16 times earnings and that's where you're going to make most of your money so again that's it's pretty simple those are the those are the you know, you know try to avoid losing money and, and, and know how you're actually making money that's how that's how I've made money in the last 15 years at least so questions yeah. go ahead so are you holding the primary in the US uh, I have prime I have um, I have uh, holdings all over the world. I own a brokerage firm in the UK. I own a, a cosmetic company in Korea. I own uh, a small company in the United States called Google. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's a uh, terrific growth rate. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, no, I own a small SNL out in, out in Michigan. So you know I'm all over the map. Um, I, I just buy whatever, whatever's cheap. So. Yes. How much of your portfolio is short position? Uh, I have a short position in, in the T bonds. Uh, I think they're at this point 25 year maturities, and I've been short for five years. Uh, but the actual bonds, I mean the actual stocks. If you look, if you look at the at the benchmark I sent you out, you'll notice the Prudent Bear Fund. Again, I, I respect the guy who runs it. He's very smart. But if you look at the last 15 years, he's returned a negative half percent per year, right? And he's working really hard. Right? So short selling is an interesting paradox. Short selling is the only asset category that consistently outperforms its index. If its index is the negative of the S&P, this guy's a hero because the S&P is up like what, 5.2% per year over the last 15 years and he's only lost a half a percent. So he's outperformed his index by 4.5%. If you've outperformed your index by 4.5% over 15 years, you're a hero, right? I mean, no, look at Fidelity and Magellan, over 15 years they're down by 1%. In the SP, and that's probably just the management fee. Okay, so so what I'm saying, he's relatively outperformed his index, but he you can't eat on negative half percent. So absolutely, he's lost money. So so when you short sell, um, it's a there's a there's a lot of um, a lot of intellectual reward to in short selling, but but to actually make money and make a living from it is very hard. Now the guys who are do it, the guys who do it. They're selling a product. They're, they're, they go out to, to the fund of funds and the consultants and say, we well, got this product. But if you peel up back what they're really telling you is that we believe that volatility is the risk, right? When the market goes down, you know, we're, when the market goes down, you know, whatever it went down in 2008, we're going to make more money in the market. And if the market goes up 20%, we're going to lose less money than the market. Um, but they're selling volatility. And th that's how they define risk. Again, you know, that's how the whole industry was built. There's, you know, but that's not how that's not how I do things. And what's interesting is, when I got my start in the business, it was 20 years ago. I was a sh I was a short selling analyst. I worked for a short fund, and it's a great way to start because you really learn how to analyze the business. You learn how to be skeptical. You learn how to analyze a balance sheet to look for exploding day sales outstanding or slowing inventory turns or something messing around with accounting or something like that. So you learn all those tricks. And you learn how to be skeptical of management. But, and then, and then, you know, I, I started the fund, my, my, uh, my hedge fund in, in 1998, and I was going to be a real, a real hedge fund, short and long and stuff like that. And I don't know if you remember 1999 and 2000, there was this internet bubble. And so I had all these shorts on, and these companies would continue to put out press releases, and the stock would go up 10% that day on, you know, absolutely no fundamentals. And it would just it would just be a total distraction, uh, and so 
you know, I, yeah, I, I, after a while in the spring of 2000, I said, I can't take it anymore. So I just covered all my shorts. And I think within 18 months, all those shorts were, were a, a hat size, maybe less than five. And I think two or three years later, literally every one of them was, was gone. They were all went chapter 11. Uh, it's just, the problem with short selling is that there's just, if you are in the long run, and again, the short run's different, but if you go like two or three years, there's just too many things working against you. So for example, I mean, you know, those businesses, they're overvalued by definition, right? So, you know, you could, you know, those companies, like what Time Warner did, what, what AOL, did, AOL did to Time Warner, again, this might be when you guys were teenagers or something like that, AOL was probably overvalued, and, and, and so they effectively bought Time Warner, although I'm sure Time Warner will disagree that Time Warner bought AOL, but it filled in the valuation at AOL, right? And, and so when the, whole, when the whole internet bubble crashed in the early 2000, AOL had all that value from Time Warner, and Time Warner had nothing, because AOL was worth, 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 not, worth a lot less than what they merged at. And so you could create a lot of value that way. If you're, if you're overpriced, stock, you can create value by issuing shares and raising cash or, or buying a real operation. And that, again, you're short that, and so you don't want them to build value, build value but they are. Uh, the other thing is that businesses has a, have a natural R ROE. So every year, you know, you know, let's say it's an average business that has a 10% return on capital, that's working against you. So you, the longer you hold it, the, the weaker you are. Uh, it will, the valuation accretes and you're just losing money. Whereas if you're on the long side, you just sit there and you, sh you should at least make the ROE of the business over time, okay? You get paid that eight bucks on, on, on Anthem, okay? Over time, uh, uh, that should work. Um, the other thing is, when you're short selling, you actually physically have to borrow the shares. And one of the things is that you never want to be weak money. Uh, you never want to borrow anything that you have to pay back. And occasionally there are short squeezes where they will say, okay, we lent you these shares a year ago, but so many people are shorted, you know, you have the choice, you know, if they give you a choice to say, we're not going to charge you, you know, 10% a year to keep those. So not only is the ROE working, they're going to charge you a 10% fee. So if you're short a million, they're going to charge you $100,000 um, to, to short that stock, to, to borrow that, sh uh, that stock to short. Or we're just going to call it in, and you you already have a loss, and you can't make it up. You're out of the game, basically. Um, uh, so there there are just <coughs> a lot of ways to 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 lose money in shorting, and as you can tell, it's it's very tough to make money. You, know, you got one of the best guys at Proven Bear Funding. You know he hasn't made money. And it's it's a terrific product, but it's it's a tough way to make money. Yes. So, so you said you started your career in 1992, and then you, you moved around uh, between 92 and 95. I was just wondering, having worked back then for, at least as I see, like the, the advent of high-speed internet and things like that, how much is fundamental, uh, how much are the fundamentals of the way you then change? Did it stay largely untouched? Well, no, I, it, it's a very good question. Again, you get, you get another sweetie. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, um, you know, when I started in, in 92, we would spend literally an hour a day yeah. just opening the mail to get 10Ks and 10Qs and then take them and put them in a file, right? And the files would be bulging and be hard to figure out if you're missing something and you're missing a Q um, and things like that. Or you would call the service called Disclosure and they would, you would say, I need it this afternoon. They'd charge you 30 bucks for it. Right now, so then I start my fund in '98, and what happened in 1998? Well, that's at least in these corporate suites that you could rent, you can get a T1 line. Yeah, and so that I, I started my business at the exact right time because then it's, everything's just a click away. So everything, the the you know the, the 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 playing field was leveled in terms of information, and not only that, it's like now you can go global. You can you can like in '92. Russia was a very foreign investment. Korea was a very foreign investment. Now people are going to Brazil, going to Poland, going to Vietnam. So, you know, the, the world is more open. That said, you know, you could argue that information, the harder information is, the more inefficient the market is. And there, and I make money off inefficiency, right? Um, you, you, know, I, you know, I have an opinion that something's worth a dollar and it's trading at 60, 70 cents. In theory, if you win a Nobel Prize, you should say that doesn't exist, right? <laughs> Rational pricing uh, in efficient markets. 
Um, but you know, you know, you could. I think arbitrage was much more inefficient then than than it is now. It's much harder to, you know, it's it's the information flow was not as prevalent then. So there were probably wider margins, more special situations like you could buy these converts or press that would convert into commons and you short the prep and go on to common or, or, or something like that. So there are really, they're a little bit more arbitrage opportunities then, um, than there is now when you can just get any information from two or three miles clicks away. But now once you have all that information, the way you do fundamental analysis in your 90s and the way you do fundamental analysis now is fundamentally the same, right? Yeah, I mean, what I practice quite as a one-man shop, I don't have... What I practice is what called is called time arbitrage and revision to the mean. So, as I said before, that you know, you know, the guy, most of Wall Street is 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 they're measuring risk on a quarterly uh, on a price volatility basis, and the reason for that is because if you work for a mutual fund or or an endowment fund, your your performance is looked at on a quarterly basis by consultants, by maybe some kind of investment committee, and things like that. Um, and, and so you're worried if your performance looks bad. If you if your stock just missed or is down 20% or is there's some kind of controversy on the stock, you know you'll get uh, you might lose your job if you're underperforming by 200 basis points, uh, you know over an extended period of time. Whereas someone like me, um, you know, let's say okay, so let's say I'll give you an example. If this was you know 2008 and you're down 15% versus the market down, whatever was down at you, 30% or something like that, you're a hero, right? You only lost 15%, everyone else lost 30. Yeah, if that's me, I can't eat. I can't, you know, I can't eat negative performance. I, I have less money, I have less Big Macs to eat that year, okay? Now, if you take this year and the market's up 22 and you're only up 15, you, you could get fired, right? You're underperforming, right? To me, Inflation's only two and a half, taxes are only 30%. I can eat a lot more Big Macs this year, so I don't really care, right? So, um, so, so, so that much, that's the one constant thing. Things haven't changed from that perspective. So that has been consistent since, since 98. I just, I just wait, my time frame's a little longer than, than, than the average institutional fund. And that's my only advantage, because I don't have the, the intellectual powerhouse the, you know, analysts working for me and getting meetings with CFOs and CEOs and things like that. I'm, I don't, they don't, you know, I don't, I don't have that type of cachet that they do. But on the other hand, my big advantage is I don't have a committee overlooking me yeah. saying, well, that was a dumb move, right? So that, that is a, 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 a big advantage, actually. Yes? Um, back to what you were talking about before with the, the bear fund and the short seller. Can you explain that you still think that's a success? It's been a loss in all years. No, I'm, I'm, it's not my job to defend it. <laughs> no, no, I, right. I, mean, I, I like I understand this short selling part. Of no, it, relatively, he's done a fantastic job. Is that what you're saying? Oh, okay, maybe that's what you're saying. Yeah. I'm saying why would I ever invest in that? So, well, let's say if you think the market's overvalued now, uh -huh. right, and you want to find the best short seller out there, um, and and what and you don't have the two hundred fifty thousand dollars and the million dollar liquid net worth to invest in one of these hedge funds and stuff like that, and you just want to, you know, an active short seller, well, you could just invest in the, in the no-load mutual fund here and, and do that. Or if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you can short an ETF or something like that, or, or there are a number of different ways. But it's, it's basically if you just want um, a hedge on your, on your portfolio. So, but what I'm saying is, you know, if you don't care about short-term performance and short-term volatility, and all you care about is long-term value, why do you need the hedge? So, you, yeah, you never be, if you're, if you're always strong money, in other words, you never borrow money, you know, um, uh, you, know you, you, you have low, ex, low living expenses, and, and no, no one can ever take anything away from you, like a house or your company on a Sunday afternoon, and you're fine. I mean, you'll see this, it's like, you know, they're in crises. They got to get things done by Sunday night. That's why Lehman failed. Because they, they, they had to have Bear Stearns and Lehman solved by the time the Tokyo markets opened, which is Sunday night at 8 o'clock or something like that. And if, if you're a big institution that doesn't have any loans to bank or doesn't have, you know, it's not depending on the overnight market to, 
to finance your business, if you just had like, I don't know, like $20 billion of cash sitting around, you can go pick up, I, I think the first, the, the bid for Bear Stearns at a takeout price was only a billion bucks. The takeout price was a billion bucks, but I think they just paid a fine on the mortgages for like 13 billion <laughs> or something like that. So the, you know, the exit costs of Bear Stearns were a lot higher than anyone anticipated in 2008. So, so if you're strong money, you know, you can avoid any of that. And if you say, I don't really, I can take the stomach of a 30% markdown on a mark to market basis. But if you're gonna do that, you better know the, what you own. You better know the value of your companies. So it's, it's, it's really amazing. I go, you know, I, and I talk to people, like, uh, I'll, I'll quiz you. So if someone owns, someone, you guys, who, does someone own Apple? Name me a stock of what you guys follow. Who owns a stock, whether they're in their personal account or the following in class? Name, give me a stock. IBM. Okay, what's it worth? Not what, the, what, what Yahoo quote says. What do you think it's worth and why? Uh, probably higher than it's trading at because they've got a strong management team. They've managed to reinvent themselves over the years. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for them in the data analytics. Mm -hmm. well, where would you sell it? Where would I sell it? Yeah. Mm, that's, that's a good question. Well, you, <laughs> do you own it? No, uh, the funds. Uh, okay. But well, my, my point is why would you ever know, why would you ever own it unless you had a strong opinion on what it's worth? And why would you buy it unless you're buying it at a discount? Right? I mean, the big thing about value investing is that we, there's something called margin of safety. Uh, uh, people heard about margin of safety if you read Intelligent Investor and stuff like that. Well, margin of safety is really two different things. It's, it's valuation and balance sheet, right? So let's go back to the process. The, the process I had, there's two ways to make money. But there's, 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 there's something more behind that. So when I look at a stock, not only do I look at how I lose it, I have a, a very short checklist on, on what I essentially need to buy it. And there's, there's, there's four items on the checklist and I need three of them. The first two are absolute requirements. One, I need a strong balance sheet, okay? Has to have net cash, not burning cash, or it's a consumer product company with reliable cash flows that have an interest rate to, to um, EBIT to interest ratio of like six, or seven or whatever the number, the higher the number, the better. In other words, absolute stable finances. Okay, so that's the first thing, and that's absolutely essential. And number two, it has to have a low valuation. Something, on a, you know, on a, does everyone know what enterprise value is? It's market cap, plus or minus that, at that. It has to have like an enterprise to normalize EBIT uh, of something like eight times pre, uh, EBIT, EBIT earnings, normalized EBIT earnings. And then it either, ha then, so it has to have those two. And then it either has to have one of the other two. It either has to have good management or it has to be a good business. If you get the first two and you get a good business with bad management teams, which happens all the time, then that management team will eventually be taken over and fired. Uh, usually over, uh, the longer the incompetence goes, the quicker that usually happens. Because the valuation is low, some LBO firm will come in and take them out, some merger will happen and take them out, or the board and the shareholders will just get sick and tired look at what's going on at Microsoft and say, you're done. Even to Bill Gates, you're done, okay? Even though you founded the firm, you haven't done anything for us for the last 13 years. So, um, um, so, so you know, you you so you can do, you can buy a mediocre business where where um, you have good management teams and that you know and you you know they understand that you know all they have to do is just liquidate the company or sell the company and you can make money that way too. So, if you just have you know the first two and one of the other two, usually you'll make money. And so the process is easy. If you have the checklist of how to lose money and make sure you stay away from that, and you have this checklist and realize the only way you make money is through the multiple expansion a little bit from the earnings, that, that goes a long way to my, my methodology right there. So, yes? Uh, since you don't have that much investing experience, is it safe to just listen to what analysts say? For example, like no, <laughs> no. Because if Goldman Sachs says something, who am I to be to say, oh no, no, I don't believe. What Goldman Sachs had almost went bankrupt in 2008. Is that the same <laughs> Goldman Sachs? Yeah, but I'm bankrupt too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you weren't leveraged 30 to one, were you? Right. Um, not, the, not to disparage the guys on Wall Street. I'm sure you know their SAT scores were a lot higher than mine, um, and, and, and things like that. But no, I mean you. If you don't know what you're doing, just buy the index. Just buy, go out and buy the Vanguard index. It's cheap, tax efficient, 
um, um, and it's going to outperform most money managers over a long period of time. Look at Fidelity. It's out. It's not. It's not a coincidence that Fidelity Magellan's return over the last four and a half year, uh, fifteen years, is around four percent, and the S and P is around five, five percent. Well, what's that difference? It's their management fee. So, so, you know, investing is like poker. If you don't know who the patsy is, it's you. So if you don't know what's going on, don't play. Yes. Just to go along with that, um, you know, there are very few money managers out there, particularly hedge funds, who actually manage to outperform the market on a consistent basis. It's very, very difficult to do that. And I think you alluded to it before that you know, you believe there are inefficiencies out there. I guess you're referring to Gene Bono, who just won the Nobel Prize, but um, you know, if it's extremely difficult to do that, um, and after taking out the management fee that a hedge fund is charged, which is relatively large, it doesn't really make sense for most investors to. Go with hedge fund. I guess what would be your pitch as to why I shouldn't just buy the index in the first place and go to hedge fund? I think you should buy the index. Okay. I've, one of the strange things about my fund, it's like, okay, back in 98 when I thought I was going to be a real hedge fund, I had ambition. I would go out to consultants and, and you know, say, you know, I work for some smart guys, I'm a one man shop, you might want to keep track on me. And, uh, you know, I did this for like the first year. And what was interesting at the end of that first year, I, I realized two things. You know, it's going to take another two years, and I have to deal with all this paperwork, like monthly reports and stuff like that, stuff that I really don't want to deal with. I just really want to pick stock. Number two, I was very fortunate in that my family had capital. And, and I know a lot of money managers don't start out like that. They, you know, they don't have the family capital back then, but I did. And, and so after the first year, I just ignored marketing and just tried to pick stocks. And what I realized that at the end of that, but by the time... I, uh, that third year ended, my performance was, was, was pretty good. It was like 15%, 30%. Like, like the third year, I shot the lights out. It was like 55% or something like that. And I realized that, that, that if I did well with my family's capital, that I didn't have to worry. That I was going to be comfortable. You know, I had a comfortable enough living just from the profits of the family capital. And if I did do well, that my... The way my, my personality made up, I, I would be really feel guilty about taking other people's money and not doing as well as Fidelity or the S&P. And that's why I benchmark all these guys. Because i got to be honest, like, you know, why should I exist when Berkshire Hathaway is out there and he has, he's a lot better than I am? So I, I continuously benchmark myself against these other, other viable firms or viable entities. Um, and so, so you know, you know I, I tell people, you know, you, you should... You know, you should just go with the best thing out there. In my own experience, um, personal experiences, I never, after, that, after that first year, I never marketed. And so if you wanted to come and invest with me, there was an open vehicle. I would charge you whatever the fee was. I think it was 1 in 20. And you can come along and invest with me, and that's perfectly fine. And, um, but, I, you know, I wouldn't go out and visit you. Um, if you wanted to call me, that's fine. But I, I didn't market it. I, I felt that, you know, Frankly, the, the performance was there. It, the fund was either bought, but I certainly wasn't going to sell the fund. Um, and then, you know, you know, fast forward 12 and a half years, Dodd and Frank came around, and I was like, I don't want to deal with any of this regulation stuff. So thank you very much. I'll just deal with my family and stuff like that. Um, but, but you're right. It's a, it's a, I don't know. I think uh, Steve and, and Rodney are better. It's like, why invest in... in you know, these, these hedge funds, because the fees are outrageous. I mean, if you think about the number of levels between the, the actual profit and, and to, the, to the individual partner, and forget about fund to funds, which is just another level of profits, okay? But there's, there's the EBIT line, and then how many levels is it to the, to the actual investor? So there's the operating profit, there's the taxes, assuming there's no debt, okay? Then there's the one in 20 fee on the hedge fund, and then there's another level of taxes <laughs> from, from the realized gain. And then there's the LP. That's a lot of levels. So, you must, again, you just skip all that and just buy the Vanguard S&P 500 fund. Now, if you know what you're doing and you have a strong opinion, that's something else. And if you really, if, you, you know, if you're honest with yourself, you track your results, and you think you can actually pick a stock and, and beat the other guys, then, you know, you have something there. Like, if you knew... Back in you know 
2008 when Apple was trading at 69 or 70 or 85 at the lowest point, that they, how much cash do they have now? Like 200 bucks in cash or something like that? Some outrageous number in cash, and they're earning like, what, I don't know, like, like 30 or 40 bucks a year. You know, you had an insight that, that a lot of people didn't have. And why not, you know? I mean, if you knew that, that iPhone was gonna be the, the second largest phone operating system in the world, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good insight, so. But you're right, it's hard to justify. It's hard to justify those fees, very hard. But some people do. I mean, there's some really good hedge funds out there like uh, like Loeb and Children's Fund and you know, those guys are, you know, my, my ex-bosses at Kensico Capital, they're really good. So there, there are definitely some, some guys who know what they're doing and they can outperform. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a couple. I just wanted to know, um, I guess, all right, first of all, uh, I don't want anything anymore. I've had to understand it already. Uh, That's why I just wanted to know uh, how you go about buying stocks. Is it that you track sectors that you have an interest in personally? Do you just read a lot? Do you just do you use certain websites? I don't know. Do you look for like games or something like that? How do you do it? Uh, again, that's a very good question. Um, uh, the good thing about this business is that after 20 years, you, you know what to look for, and you have a, a, a certain, you know, kinship to certain industries like, you know, technology or software. Um, I prefer because generally they have a very strong balance sheet. They, they usually have net cash. Uh, financial firms are very complex, but I seem to know them a little, a little bit better than, or have more, I think, more accurately, more success with those investments than other investments. Um, but, you know, I do look at the 52-week low list, and you can tell, like, if you go to Barron's when there's a bull market and a bear market. In the bull market, like there is now, most of the stocks, like a heavy preponderance of the names will be in the 52-week high list. Or in a bear market, like, you know, half the stock table will be, in 2008 and, and, the, and the winter of 2009, half the stock table was in the new low list. Um, I get a lot of idea, from my, idea flow from my friends, um, a preponderance of ideal flow from my friends, um, and again, as a one-man shop, I'm, I'm sort of cribbing because, you know, you know, you know, think I, I like to talk to people to see what if I'm making a mistake in my thesis. So I'll call up a friend who owns a stock and say, "What about this risk? What about that risk?" or things like that. So, you, so yeah, you, you get a, I get a lot of ideal flow from that. But I'm constantly reading. I read three papers, a, you know, two or three papers a day. The Economist, tons of SEC stuff tons of research report, you know, I got, you know, every day I'm probably reading like 100, 200 pages of, of stuff. So I'm, I'm really a professional reader, really. You're an engineer, right? Like an engineer, right? Yes, so yes. Does that factor into the way you look at companies, tech companies, like that? In the sense that, you know, engineering is about redundancy. Okay. So if you think about value investing, it's a, it's a redundant system. If you look at the, the pro, it's a process, engineering is a process, right? If you look, if, um, if you look at the way the margin of safety is set up, you have two levels of safety. One is the balance sheet. Number two is the valuation. Again, let's go back to the balance sheet. Again, you never want to be weak money, okay? So when a 2008 happens, okay, you can't do anything about the stock, the stock price action. Everything is going to get flushed down in 2008. What you can hope for is that, a, that you've, you've done your homework beforehand, and that company can take its strong balance sheet and make its shares more valuable by either buying back their own shares at a low valuation or taking out market share by taking out the competition. So again, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm losing like one or 2% a week, but I'm not losing a lot of sleep because I know my companies are, are, are taking out market share, uh, strengthening their, their organization uh, and, and things like that. So that's, you know, that, that's where you, you insist on strong market share. Um, but, e you know, but you know, even before I enter a position, I assume that something's going to go wrong, or, or the reason I'm entering the position, I assume something's going to go, something is wrong, because you're buying something cheap. The reason why you're buying something cheap is that there's something wrong. It's in. It's like when you go to Safeway and they have that cart with all the dinged up cans and stuff like that. It's still edible, but it's not attractive. Well, that's what value investing is. You're getting those cheap cans because there's something wrong with it, but it's still usable. And so, the reason why you insist on a strong balance sheet is because you want that that company, that, that equity position to survive. If you bought equity position in GM or Ford, you didn't, you couldn't, it's a, head, it's, a, it's a flip of a tail whether Ford survives, which it did, or whether GM, the equity is wiped out and, half the, and the bonds are wiped out too. So 
Um, so, you know, before you even enter a position, you should assume that things are screwed up or things are going to get bad, and you want to make sure that they can survive that bad time. So that's why I always insist on a strong mastery. It takes a lot of risk out. Yeah? I was wondering how often do you kind of change your positions? Um, I know you do your time as a card extension and kind of get how, how often are you actually? Whenever it hits full value or fair value or fairish value, like I was just telling Rodney and, and Steve, I hate my portfolio now. A lot of things are full value. Um, and so I'm just, you know, I've gone from like, 82% invested down to 72. By the time I'm finished, I'll probably be in the mid 60s in terms of investments. I have 35% cash, so you know I, I tell you know my my investors, which is my you know my brother, my my parents, I tell them number one, you know not only did we get paid for 2013 for all the stuff we did in 2008, but we probably got paid for 2014 and 2015 too. So you know don't expect great returns for the next you know two or three years because we've got paid and I'm not gonna. Throw money in the market just to throw money in the market. So, I mean, the toughest thing to do in investing is just sitting and waiting. It's not, it's not the reading. The boringest thing to do is reading. The toughest thing to do is sitting and waiting. And, and that's true when you own a position too. It's like, am I missing something here, or is there, or or is everyone else, you know, just sitting on the sidelines, which happens a lot. And sometimes it's because I'm missing something and I, and I screwed up the analysis. Yes. So why um, why a one man shop? Um, Is it because like you have all the prior work experience, you've seen how the corporate world works, how corporate life? Did you feel like it's just better for you to be in control of everything? Yeah, it fits my personality. I would never fit in a corporate world. Um, I I have dyslexia. I I can't write a memo and stuff like that. So it's just easier to work for myself. Now it doesn't mean I don't have intellectual partners. Um, you know, I have some of my best friends are some of the best value investors in the world. It's, it's that, it, but I always felt that if you're going to have a partner, and it, it works for most, most hedge funds are partnerships. Uh, they have two general partners. And I guess part of that is because if they, if they go to the consultants and one of them gets hit by a bus, they, they want that redundant system there. Um, but, you know, I always felt that, that, that if I had a partner, it's just outsourcing you know, 30 to 50 percent of my portfolio. It's, it's a marriage, and you may not like agree with the position <coughs> your partners are taking in a certain stock, but you got to live with it. Just like when you get married, you got to live with certain. You know, you got to live with your partner's peccadillos, right? And that's that's part of the part of the deal. And um, and I didn't want to, frankly, deal with that. And so, you know, let's say if me and a friend who works for another fund, we're working on the same stock. Maybe he likes it more than I do, so maybe he makes it a 10% position of what I make it at three. And it doesn't matter, because I'm not tied to him. We're just doing the work, we're bouncing ideas off each other, no fuss, no muss. So that's, that, it, that's how it worked for me. So, but other people who I have a lot of respect for, and I think they're going to be very successful, you know, love the partnership thing. I mean, you, know, look at, you look at Munger and Buffett and stuff like that, and you know, certainly there, there are a lot of them that are out there that work well. It was just how it fit my personality. Yeah. So I guess just going off of that in terms of, so like, you know how like let's say a big bank they have access to these resources, you know, like, like the research analysts they have, Bloomberg they have these different types of research reports that they look at. So I know if you look at periodicals, you look at um, you know whatever financial publications, you look at but in terms of the actual like types of research reports, like do you have industry connections that you're able to fall back on in terms of? Yeah, that's part of the you know it's part of the deal of having you know. You know, a strong network of, of of friends and you know things like that. You can share resources and things like that, that and that's very important too. So even though I'll, technically I'm a one man shop, it's not like you know you have to be resourceful. Let's put it that way. And you, you know, being a one man shop, you are more resourceful because you have, you have to do more with less. So like I don't mean I mean I've been in the business for 15 years. I never. I don't have Bloomberg. I use Yahoo quotes, right? And Morningstar and Value Line. So it's, 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 it's really not that much more complicated than that. Can you talk about how you uh, value a company? Um, okay, so there, there are two parts to, the, to uh, uh, evaluation of a company. Let's, let's take a stock that you guys own. So, uh, 
Name me some stocks that you guys own. What do you Apple, own? What? Qualcomm. Qualcomm. Okay, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that business well very well, but but uh, do you know the numbers on it? Uh, like, yeah. so what's the, what's the stock price? It is sixty-seven. <laughs> okay. And so, what's the market cap? Uh, uh, one hundred fifteen billion. One hundred fifteen. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what's the uh, what's the net cash per share? I'm sorry. What's the net? What's the enterprise value? Uh, four hundred fifty billion. Four hundred billion. Eighty-four billion. Is that net cash or just cash? It's net cash. Wow. Enterprise value. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of money. 30. Okay. So is it, it can't be eighty-four billion because. Oh, okay, okay. No, that's the enterprise value. So yeah, there's yeah. 30 billion, 30, 30 billion cash. Okay, so there's 30 billion cash. So the 30 billion, we'll all agree, let's make an assumption, the 30 billion is worth 30 billion. Okay, so there's two parts of my valuation. There's the balance sheet, which is, is what it is. And then there's the operation. The operation of Qualcomm. What's the, what's the 20, 2014 and 2015 EBIT estimates, or net income estimates? Uh, I made an assumption myself, but I'm not sure. Is there the estimates? No, the first week, so. Okay. So net income is 7.5 billion, 7.9 billion, about 2014. Uh, 2014. Is that EPS? Yeah. Okay, 492. 4.92. 4.92. And what's 2015? 5.2. Okay, 5.2. And I don't know, I know that's a great business, but I'm not sure. Frankly, with Qualcomm, I'm not sure what happens with 5G or 6G. So that's, that's, that's the key there. But let's just say, let's say, assume it's steady state and it keeps on growing. So you have, you have this, you have, this is worth, how many shares are outstanding? One point seven. Yeah. Okay, so let's call let's call this like worth two dollars a share right there. Okay? So that, that cash is two dollars per share. Does everyone see how I got that? One point seven divided by thirty. I'm making an estimate, rough estimates. It's actually a little less, it's like one point eight dollars a share. Yeah. So let's make it two. Okay, so the second question is, what are you willing to pay for these two numbers? And what's it worth in twenty fifteen? That's a revenue growth. That's earnings growth. That's earnings. These are earnings. Um, so, if I were to go to you and say, you know what, I'm going to pay you 35 bucks for this, would you take that trade, given that there's two bucks in cash? Are you going to pay me 35 bucks? Yeah. Let's say you have a claim on this forever yeah, on Qualcomm, and that, the 5.2 is good forever. Every year they're going to pay you 5.2. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So let's make that assumption. That's that's what they're going to earn every year per year forever. Yeah. I'm willing to pay you 35 bucks for it. Would you will, would you would you sell me that claim for 35 bucks? Depends how sure I am growing like that. What? Depends how sure I am growing like that. Well, let's let's say you're pretty sure, like you're 80 percent sure. No, I wouldn't. Say that. Okay. That's the right answer, right? Because why would you sell me anything at seven times earnings? Yeah. Right. Especially in a world. Not only, I'm not really buying it from you at 35. I'm really buying it at 33 because I had a two dollars there. And plus, by then they'll have another four, five bucks, right? So really, that thirty-five bucks is really a twenty-eight dollar price. Does everyone see where I got that? So I had two dollars off this year, and then five dollars off next year. Did you get that? Okay. So, the, the, so I'm offering thirty-five bucks, right? But I'm not. But they already have two bucks in cash, so I'm really offering thirty-three bucks, right? But next year in twenty fourteen, they're supposed to earn another five bucks. So I'm not really paying five bucks. I'm really paying twenty-eight dollars. For a claim on his five point two dollars forever, so that's that's like five and a half times that year's earnings. That's ridiculous. I wouldn't I wouldn't do that, right? So the question is, what multiple would you pay for this? If I offered you a hundred dollars, would you take that deal? It's closer to what you would take. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I mean, you could. That's that's the game you play. Everything has a value. The average business over a period of time is worth sixteen times earnings. Okay. And the reason why you get there, I'm making a shortcut of everything. 
But if you say the average business is at least equal to the 10-year treasury yield, the inverse of the 10-year treasury yield, and the average 10-year treasury yield is traded at like five and a half for the last 50 years, even though it's down at two and a half now, it's been as high as 11. The average is five and a half. If you inverse that, that's 16-ish. That's I think that's a little higher. It's like 16, it's, it's a little bit higher. So the average business is worth 16 times earnings. So you could say Qualcomm is better than the average business or worse than the average business. If you say it's better than the average business and it's 100 bucks, you know, 20 times five is 100 bucks, plus the, you know, the $2 that's currently on the balance sheet, plus the five bucks I earn next year, 107 is fair value. Okay? What's the stock price today? 67. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? That's a lot of upside. So the question is, what happens in 5G? If anyone on YouTube knows what happens in 5G, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. That's where it comes in, where you have to read their campaign, their MQs, you go through all, they go through their competition, see what they're, see what's really happening, then you get an idea, or you. Welcome to my world. That's what we do. Right. Right. I mean, you know, you know, like I, I own Bank of New York, right, and. They, they said they have a savings plan of $600 million of savings every year, and they took, the, they took the restructuring charge two years ago. And yet their expenses are higher, than, are moving up higher, at a faster pace than their revenue. Yeah. Where's the $600 million? So I have to go, not, I'm going to call the company and ask them. But before I do that, I've got to figure out what's going on with Northern Trust and State Street, because those are the competition. Uh, you, know, you notice little things like transactions are off for everyone on Wall Street, Bank of America. The stock exchanges, are, their, their transactions are off. Um, so, you know, that's the type of work we do. That's, that's why I'm reading 100 pages a day. Yeah. So, but did everyone uh, understand how I got the valuation? It's not that hard. It's, it's, there's two things. There's the operation and there's the balance sheet. So basically you're saying that it should be 107 is the fair price that it's going to 57, which is like $40. Yeah, basis. so you do the IRR, right? You know, you're, you're buying a claim at 67. And you think the fair value is 107. Mm -hmm. Now that's, you know, I don't know. I think Qualcomm is very interesting. Okay, yeah. I don't know it that well. Right. Okay, so it, it comes to understanding their business and where are they going to be in 5G and 6G? Is I mean, what's their relationship to ARM? You know, which is the microprocessor of, of, of smartphones and things like this. So I, I I don't have enough in it. But I tell you what, you know, after earnings seasons, I'm going to try to find out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Should I do another company? Uh, excuse me? Do I another company? It, what what are other companies you guys own? I have a quick question. Sure. You said the average earnings is 16 times, but why do we multiply by 30 here? No, we, oh, Matt, we multiply by 20. Oh, 20. Okay. okay, because let's just make the assumption that they have something for 5G and 6G. Okay. Then I would say that Qualcomm is a better than average business. And you go around, you like, when you guys are driving in a car or thinking or looking at businesses as you're walking on the street, you should, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a, a professional investor or investor, Ask yourself, is this a good business or a bad business? Is, is like selling newspapers a good business or a bad business? Well, if you sell it in print, it's a pretty bad business. Maybe Jeff Bezos can make it a better business, okay? You know, is selling, you know, is, is, is Visa MasterCard, is that a good business or a bad business? That's a pretty good business. Right? Is Google a good business or a bad business? That's a good business. If you're selling, you know, you know something that takes a lot of, a lot of capital, and you, you hope that they're going to come and, and you know, use that service as a product, and maybe that's not a good business. So is it a possible way to, for example, kind of, because that number seems pretty important, that 16 times earnings, maybe take an industry and then kind of divide that, divide it back to see what the... Well, that's a good question, because not all businesses are worth 16 times. Exactly. And, I, and I have a, I personally am I'm graph, um, trying, to, trying to reconcile this myself, because... One of the margin of safety is you buy a good business. You buy an average business, and that gives you a lot of margin of safety because you just wait, it's not gonna get destroyed. But what happens when you buy a, a you know, HP, which is trading at six or seven times earnings right now, okay? Is that an average business? Well, you can make an argument, no, PC is not an average business. You know, the printer business is going, just not, it's probably not gonna be bigger five years from now than it is today. Um, you can, you can make an argument that services and software business is above average business. But I'm thinking like, hey, I'd be happy if I bought it at seven and sold it at 12. But by conceding that I'm willing to sell it at 12, I'm conceding that it's a bad, it's not a, it's, it's a below average business by definition. And 
why should I be investing in the below average business? Well, maybe it's because that's the only thing open on the market right now. And, you know, I'm, you know, it's, you know, you can still make money from six to twelve. So, um, but you have to. That's where the judgment comes in. Is this a? And you're not going to be right all the time. Um, but if you're right eighty percent of the time, you'll be fine. So, but that, you should constantly play that game. Is this a good business? And that is, and that's why. In this business, in the, in the stock picking business, the longer you're in the business, the better you are. Like in a ba if you're a baseball player, your skills decline after I don't know, 12, 13. If you have a 15 year career, that's exceptional. Whereas in stock picking, if you're in it for 15 years, by definition, you know, you're gonna have more than enough money to live because it's a very self-selecting uh, business. The market will find your weaknesses. The market is like water, it's like, the, the current doesn't seem very strong every day, but over time it will fill in your weakness and it will take you out of the game. So if you're in this business, the longer you're in this business, by definition you survive. And by, if you survive, that means you've, you've had to have done it somewhat well over that period of time. So, but you know, you should play these these games in terms of the businesses you like and why. And more importantly, then when you when you when you have that business targeted, you want to inverse it. You want to, and this is a very engineering way of thinking, but you, you want to say, how can I destroy this business? And so you want to see if those things are going to happen or not and what, what can make those things happen and be aware of those risks. So. Is there an evaluation of Apple? Or Who's doing Apple? I am. Okay. Uh, Let's let's start simple. Do you uh, do you know how much cash per share they have? Um, do you know, do you know how much what the cash per share is? Okay. So let's call it a hundred and thirty billion. And what's the uh, what's the number of shares? Why are you thinking hundred and thirty billion? Because you could see on the on the Bloomberg that there is one hundred forty six billion in. Right. And then it was 16 billion preferreds. Oh. So you take out the preferreds. 900 million. A billion. Okay. And so was that it was like $140 a share or something like that. Okay. So it's 140. So that's that's pretty good. So you start at 140 bucks. Stock's trading at what? 500. 500. They call it 500. So you're buying the actual business, assuming tax efficiency and stuff like that, which you can't really because it's an island. You're actually buying the business at 360. And so what's the 2014 earnings? So that's 43, 40, 30. Okay, and what's what's uh, what's 2015? 2015 is 47.50. Okay. So you buy it for 360 now, you get paid another 43 bucks if everyone's right, so you're down to, I don't know, 320. You're paying 320 for a claim of 47 bucks. Uh, that's like, what, seven times earnings or something like that? That's a pretty good deal. Right, so the question is though, do you know what Apple's gonna look like in 20, 2016, 2017? You think it's gonna change? Personally, yes. Yes, what do you think's gonna happen? Because they're releasing the same iterations of the stuff, the same product, they're going to behave like Microsoft, and so they're going to start maturing. Uh -huh. and they're going to start the stock price probably will start to go down uh -huh. and just sit in the, like, in the little like, niche area of the tech market. Well, let's make it simple. Do you think their net income will be larger five or six years from now than it is today? No. Okay. All right. And so in that case. Even though it's cheap, if you make that assumption, which I don't disagree with, I agree with your assumption, then it's hard to put a multiple on that. It's hard to put a multiple on declining earnings. What, what multiple do you put on Kodak in 2005? It doesn't matter, right? So I was at the Google campus last week, and fascinating place on many different levels. Um, and the one insight I had was that one company, and not that Apple and Google are mutually exclusive investments, but the one observation I had 
was that one company is really helped by low-cost phones, which is Google. And one company is really hurt by low-cost smartphones, which is Apple. And what is the one thing we know that's going to happen? Right. Smartphones are just computers. And what happened to the computer in the last 15 years? Right. So I might be wrong, but this is what I would say is too difficult for me to figure out, even though it's statistically cheap. So, and that, that, that could be true with HP too, in, in which I do have a, a, a small position. In. So, how do you value HP? Um, I, I'll give you one better. I'll do Samsung, right? Okay. Samsung also makes handsets, right? It's in Korea, right? And you could buy the, the, their junior securities at like 960 bucks. I'm not making up these numbers, okay? And so Samsung is really four different businesses. It's, it's the phone, it's the chips, they make uh, DRAM chips, they make TVs, and they make glass for your screens. Okay? All the value was, all the, all the operating profit was in phone and then chips. Right? So, they have two securities, one is the A class share one, and one's the B class share. One's voting, one's non voting. They're called common and preferred. Preferred in Korea doesn't have the same meaning as preferred in the United States. Preferred, yet, you know, it's, it's actually more akin to a junior, junior no vote, it's, it's more akin to like a junior common security in Korea. But you could buy it at like 950, 950 bucks a share, okay? And there's like 250 bucks of cash and other investment securities there. They have like all these inner holdings and stuff like that. It's crazy. It's crazy. But there's like a lot of assets on there. Right? It's like worth 250 bucks. And I might be off by 50 bucks or something like that. In other words, you can buy the business at 700. And they're supposed to earn like 200 bucks a share. So that's three and a half times after tax earnings. So it looks really cheap. And I, so I bought 200 shares, right? Just to keep it a market. But I wouldn't put that much money. Because their own business has 20, 20 mid-20 margins, right? And the chip business is actually, that actually, the dynamics are actually going up. But that's unsustainable. Mid-20 margins in the, in, in, in the phone business are unsustainable. And that's why I didn't buy a lot. It's too cheap to ignore. And, if, and the thing is, if you break down the businesses and you say, even with mid-20 margins, I'm only assigning a 0.3 times revenue valuation for this because eventually the margins go down to 3%. From 25 to 3, 20 to 3, it's going to be ugly. Um, but eventually the margins go only 3%, call that 0.3 times revenue. If you do that, if you break down the valuation, you still get like $1,400 uh, $1, a share. So there still was enough margin of safety in there for me to, if it wasn't going to go bankrupt, you still have the segments that are worth a lot and it's still worth $1,400 a share. Uh, two hundred dollars, not going to be two hundred dollars in a couple of years. It's going to be a lot less. So, you would HP is the same. HP has several different businesses that have different valuations. They have uh, the network equipment business. Uh, they have the old EES, which is sort of like Accenture, but not nearly as well run. Uh, they have uh, they have the uh, the software business, which is a, a, a decent business. They have the hardware business divided between PCs and printer business. The printer business is a pretty good business, although a bit declining. And the PC business is a really, really tough business. So you would just break down the segments in HP. But that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, if you have to use a 12 multiple, maybe you shouldn't be buying the stock. But on the other hand, six or seven times earnings, that's a real cheap stock. So you can make money. You can, I guess, you know, the bottom line, you can make money off bad businesses, just as long as you buy at the right price. Not, and I'm not saying HP is a bad business. I think some of their businesses are pretty decent. So. Any, Washington Post and its new owners. Well, he chose the right guy. I mean, Don. I love Don Graham. He's 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 one of the CEOs I, I really admire. He does things the right way. Um, and he chose the right right owner. I mean, there's you know you want you want someone with vision who can withstand the deep pockets. And he's Jeff Bezos. 
there's any, there's, there are two people who I think have, could possibly replace Steve Jobs in terms of vision, in terms of value to the, to the consumer. And one is Jeff Bezos, and the other one is Larry Page. And you know, you know, Amazon is a great service. Uh, you know, they've definitely changed the landscape, and it's going to be tough. You know, you know, uh, tough for a lot of people to compete. It is tough for a lot of people to compete with them. It's not going to get easier. Um, and so, uh, you know. And frankly, with the post, it's all about Kaplan at this point. I mean, the uh, the, the the TV business is, is pretty fully valued. If you fully value the TV business and the cable business and the balance sheet, then you're paying like half revenue for Kaplan, which is not just higher education, but it's also test prep and things like that. And no one knows where where education is going to go. It's obviously unaffordable at this point. Not just at the nonprofit, not just at the for-profit schools like Apollo and Strayer and Kaplan. But at this, you know, at the state schools and and at GW, the affordability of tuition is just is it's unaffordable, and things are going to get rolled back. That plus you have, a, you know, other technologies out there like MOOCs and TED. There's a lot of ways ways to learn. Maybe you won't even need a degree anymore. Maybe if you just prove that you pass this this uh, computer uh, artificial intelligence class on a MOOC from MIT. And you, and you can prove that you passed it, maybe you can get a job at, at EDS without paying the $160,000 CS degree from, from some school. So things are changing. And it's, hard, it's hard to figure out where things are going to go, things are going to be. Career advice? Uh, you know, I, I was very lucky. Um, at a very early age, even though I studied engineering, I realized what I wanted to do. I wanted to, I wanted to be a stock picker. And not only, you know, a stock picker, but I wanted to be a value investor. I was, um, I was reading a book called The Midas Touch, which was written by John Train, and The Money Masters, which was also written by John Train, uh, right before I had to choose which business school I was going to go to. And one of them was Columbia, and the other one was UVA. And uh, when I was looking at the brochure, I noticed that Jimmy Rogers was teaching at Columbia. And I also noticed uh, that at the time, this was 20 years ago, that UVA had had exams on Saturday because they, they were so busy during the middle of the week with classes, and that Columbia had Friday off. <laughs> so, so there you go. <laughs> I'm signing up. Who cares if it costs twice as much at the time? But it was actually a very good investment because um, I was able to transition. I was I was I was actually working for started at, at Accenture when I got out of uh, engineering school, and I was able to transition out of IT into investment management. And it was, it was not easy because the big companies like Fidelity and Putnam, they wouldn't give me a chance because I had no experience, no background. Um, and it took me a long time to find a job in investing, and particularly value investing. And then uh, it took me like a year. To, like I decided that I wanted to be a value investor in my second year at business school. So from, the, from that September, beginning my, second, my third semester there, until I think the end of September of the next year, until I got my first paid job in, in investing. And even then, it was getting paid half what a starting MBA from Columbia was being paid at the time. I had to pay my own benefits, and I had to work in my own efficiency, you know, one, you know, not even a, a bedroom, but it was an efficiency, and it was on the first floor, and it was way up waste in Manhattan. Um, and, but, but Columbia, I was very lucky because it was Columbia. Um, I was able to make a lot of that, that even though no one gave me a, a paid job, um, I got a lot of, of, of great experiences just from the interview process. I, would, I think I interviewed with 20 value investing firms in that 12 month period. And you know, you get to meet people at, at, at these things. I mean, the, the, the person who gave me my first internship, non paying internship, is still a very close friend. Um, uh, and I met him because he was on, I just went up to the alumni office and said, give me three names who I can call for career advice. And I went into this gentleman's office and I said, I work for you for free. And he, you know, he said, I still don't think you're worth it, but, but he gave me a shot anyways. And, 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 you know, I was able to parlay that until he gave me his contacts and, you know, I was able to develop a lot of relationships that way that were, ex they're extremely invaluable even to the day uh, in terms of ideal flow, in terms of friendship. Um, but, but the key there was passion, because I, I definitely knew what I wanted to do. And um, I was willing to pay a heavy price in terms of short-term 
it was a lot of delayed gratification because you know I was I, I, I paid you know I was willing to take half salary um, for the first couple of years pay my own benefits um, you know there was a lot of delayed gratification there let's put it that way so but it, you know you know I, I, you know, I can't I'm really lucky in the sense I found my passion not a lot of people have found their passion so whatever it is whatever your passion is take your risk now and follow it so um, I mean, it's it will pay off dividends, you know, a way uh, that, that are well worth. Nothing, nothing is worse than having a job that you that you don't have passion for. That's that's a tough way to go through forty years. So maybe along with the career advice, what sort of good habit? If people want to be an investor or even just investor in money, what sort of good habit should they start creating now that will serve them, you know, ten years, twenty years from now? Well, always be strong in money. Okay, try not to borrow money. I can understand why you would borrow money for a house. I know this sounds simple, but you know I can understand a mortgage given the tax deductibility of it and the fact that houses are still relatively cheap. But you know, obviously, pay off your student debts as soon as possible. Pay off your credit card debts. Never have credit card debt if possible because that's really high cost. But you know, um, you know, try to try to bank like, you know, figure out what you're spending a year. And try to bank that and leave it in a checking account and don't invest that because that's your rainy day fund. Because stuff is going to happen in your life, and you you just don't know when. And you always want to be strong in money when stuff happens. So whether you get laid off from work, so you're not going to panic immediately and take the first job, whatever that you don't like and stuff like that. Um, and and again, it takes sacrifice. It takes delayed gratification. It's not, I'm not saying it was it, it, it's easy, um, but you know. I mean, there's there's no secrets to success. It's just passion and discipline. I get up, I you know, I'm usually at my desk at 5:40 in the morning, every morning. Now you say, you know, yeah, I'm I'm very lucky. I'm, I you know, I really don't have to work for a living anymore. Um, why are you up at 5:40 in the morning? And not only that, at 10 o'clock at the previous time, I'm still reading stuff, right? It's because I love what I do. So I'm very lucky at that. Now, maybe circling back on the process, you mentioned most of the other things. Maybe a bit more on how you evaluate good management, and how you distinguish good from bad. Um, it's like art, you know, when you see it. You know, like, you read the shareholder's letter, right? And if he says stuff about everything else besides, if it, if it takes the second or third paragraph for him to get to the financial results, then you know he's not thinking about the financial results. If, he, if, it, if his shareholder letter He's more like a marketing brochure. You know, he's not. He's not trying. He's not thinking about shareholder returns. But if he's talking about return on capital, EPS, he tells you what went wrong and why and how they're going to fix it. If he's having an honest dialogue through you, then 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 you know he's a good good CEO. I would recommend, that for examples, you should read Don Graham's of the Washington Post. He writes one of the best letters around. He's very honest. Now, not always successful, but very honest and and. Uh, and working things through, and, he, and he's having an honest dialogue with you. Obviously, Berkshire Hathaway has a very honest uh, letter. Strayer, which is again, um, not, has not been a successful investor, I mean, and it is in for profit. But if you read that, uh, his letter, the chairman's letter in there, it's one of the best letters I've read. Um, Signet uh, Juror, Jury, which is, uh, which I don't really have a position in anymore, but it's um, it's Jared's Jury and Kay's Jury. If you read their shareholder letter and the, the fact that they measure return on capital and things of that nature, um, you, know, you know that that CEO is trying to tell you something. Costco, Expeditors, those, those CEOs, Progressive, those guys are trying to tell you something. They're trying to treat you as a partner. They're trying to treat you with respect. On the other hand, if you go into, you know, if you go, if, if you look at a CEO and he does a merger and he says it was accretive, when the cost of, you know, the cost of, Issuing a bond right now is two or three percent, which implies that that's his hurdle. You know, he's a, that's intellectually dishonest. If, if, if you went, to, if you were, you know, a manager and your subordinate came with you and said, "We're going to spend all this money, and we're going to get a four or five percent return on capital," you would you would shoot the guy. You'd say, "You know, go work for someone else because that's an inadequate here. You're going to take on a risk. You got to tell me the return on capital, and and it better be in the mid double digits for for taking the risk." And that you, you hear about all these acquisitions, and it's always you hear the word accretive. 
And it's just so intellectually dishonest. It's, it's what Wall Street wants to hear. It grows the EPS. It tells you nothing about the economic value add. The economic value add is defined by the reason. You put $100 in, when are you going to get your 14, 15 bucks out in perpetuity per year? And if you're not going to get it, don't do it. Right? So that's, that's when, you, when you know. And, I mean, you know, you can still make money buying mediocre management. You just have to wait until they get fired, which, <laughs> which happens. It happens a lot. Hasn't happened much given your returns, but you, talk, you mentioned uh, for profit education, some other uh, mistakes that you uh, stumbled upon? Uh, well, I'll tell you the mistake of for profit education because I think the first time I came here to speak, like four or five years ago, I was all hot and heavy about this company called University of Phoenix. And uh, I think I bought it at 60. Today, it traded up 20% because they beat their numbers. They still had negative enrollment, uh, but they beat their numbers. And it traded 20, at 25 bucks a day. So I was really wrong on for-profit education. And I lost 10% of my net worth on for-profit education because it wasn't Apollo that I lost my money. It was this company called Career Education, which I had a huge amount of investment in. Uh, and when I originally did uh, the analysis of, on for-profit education, I said, this is the perfect business. I was buying them at eight times, or eight times or less EBIT, which is my first criteria. They have super strong balance sheets because you pay all your tuition up front, right? They had all that cash per share. So that two of them right there. Return on capital is infinite because there's no capital involved, right? These are for-profit universities. Any capital is paid by the tuition, prepaid by the tuition. So the return on capital is triple digit, right? All of them are buying back shares. Great, good management, good business, solid balance sheet. So how did I lose all that money? Well, they abused, and it wasn't just for-profit. And it wasn't all the regulation that came in because there was a lot of, a lot of noise about regulation um, and these guys scamming everyone and stuff like that. But that's not what killed them. This is what's killing the whole, not just the for-profit, but the whole education industry right now. It's simple. When you abuse your pricing power, when you raise your service greater than the cost of inflation over an extended period of time, it's just a matter of time before the consumer revolts and they just don't buy your product. And that's what the whole industry did. Whether it was in-state schools, private nonprofit schools, or for-profit schools, they just continue to raise their, their, their tuition 5% a year. And you can't do that. It, it, you just price the middle class out of the market. And what you're seeing now is huge tuition cuts going on. Right? I think there was this, I'm, I'm sure I got this wrong, but there's this university, a, a, a public school in Maryland called John Carroll, something like that. Is that is it some little broad school in college? And I, I may, in Maryland, I, th I, th I may be getting the name wrong. But they, they had to fire their president because he missed his numbers. They had like, he was shooting for 500 and he came in at 400 and they dismissed him. It's, you know, the college, the, you know, higher education is, 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 was, is priced way out of the market. And the market's reacting. Schools are giving more tuition, uh, discounts called scholarships now. So if you guys are paying full price, you should go talk to the financial aid office. They're willing to cut your bargain, maybe. Um, um, and, and we'll leave that from the uh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, but but the whole industry abused that, and that's why uh, these for profit that were uh, investments were an absolute disaster. So, I mean, because you would think if you're training someone to to uh, to have more knowledge so they can increase their their economic position by being better trained, that's a good product to have. But when you keep, when you continue to price it out of the market. There's, you know, you know, you're gonna you're gonna lose a lot of people. So, so what other industries are doing that right now? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know of any. But it's cable companies. E content. It's really the content because most cable companies make money on your data. They really don't make that much money, even though they're increasing the pricing on video. All that money is going to the baseball team and the football teams and, and the sports packaging and CBS. It's going to the content. It's not, it's not really going to, to the cable companies. So, but, but that whole entertainment system is, is definitely pricing, pricing themselves out of the market. So maybe, maybe television advertising. So maybe, again, this is the reason not to own TV companies like the Post does. But certainly, they're losing eyeballs. And they're, they're saying, well, you still can't get this many eyeballs for this price. And so, you know, the the effectiveness of that um, local advertising on TV or even broadcast TV is, is declining in the value proposition. So that's something that I'm very concerned about. 
in terms of in, in terms of that. Um, and, uh, um, but yeah, you look at CBS and was it uh, the LA, the Southern California cable system. CBS said, you know, we're going to charge you two bucks. <laughs> you know, cable system said we don't, we don't, we're, we're not going to carry it. But CBS won. But how many times can they go to the well? Is it five bucks a month? At some point, it has to stop. What do you think about Chrome, Google Chrome, the device that you put yeah. in? Uh, oh. I haven't used it yet. I should buy it for thirty-five bucks. I, I mean, um, I, I I don't know. But again, you know, Google's done a wonderful job. I own Google. It's my largest position. Um, you know, you know, Larry Page is the other guy who's made life, maybe not as you know, has made life much more easier to live in and enjoyable. Maybe not as elegant as Steve Jobs did it, but there's so many valuable things that Google offers. Gmail, calendars. Look, my my. I don't need a secretary. Maybe 50 years ago, I needed a secretary to, to, to figure out my calendar or my Rolodex. Now I just put it in my Google Calendar. It shows up my phone instantaneously. So you know, and that's just one small example. So their products are maybe not as elegant, but they're certainly very usable, and they and they are getting better. Um, I was just using Google Drive today for the first time in a long time because it's so convenient. I just upload my files. I don't have to put them on, you know, and I can just read them at home at my, my leisure. So, uh, you know, you know, you know, YouTube's a wonderful learning tool. Um, I mean, think about the company. I mean, 13 years ago, they had search, and they got lucky. They, they said, how do we have this wonderful product? How do we make money? They throw things against the wall, and they come up with AdWord. You know, they get like a nickel every time you press a button. Wonderful. Great. But it's not a one-trick pony. The guys come up with they buy a phone before anyone realizes, hey, we need to own a, you know, you need a, you need a, a mobile platform. So they buy a phone company, a handset business in 2005 or 2006. 2005, 2006, they buy YouTube for a billion dollars. I think they get like three or four billion dollars a year from it. So, I mean, and, and YouTube's a wonderful product. If you want to learn how to cook a dish or learn how to fix your bathroom or fix your car, you know, you can go in there and you can find someone who knows how to do it and you can just copy it. And, th and think about YouTube. Um, it's it's I don't understand like as a well, when, when I learn how to fix my bathroom like my kitchen sink and I need caulking and this and that because I don't know anything about fixing anything <laughs> I'm looking at this YouTube thing and YouTube knows where I am because they have the cookies and stuff like that and they know where the Home Depot is because they have the maps and they know where the Lowe's is I don't understand why when I'm looking at that video 15 minutes like five seconds later I don't get a, a coupon from Home Depot saying if you come in the next 24 hours to buy caulking will give you like you know half the caulking off or something like that, or something. Or like when I watch a movie trailer, like you know I wanted to go see, hey, what's this gravity thing all about, right? So I go on to YouTube, watch the gravity video, and I say, oh, pretty neat, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to get, you know, it, it, it looks like a good movie, but I don't understand. Like, okay, so YouTube knows I'm watching it. Um, they know where the movie theater is that I'm going to go see it at because I, you know, I, I pressed on the movie theater. I don't understand why I don't get a dollar off for the popcorn. Right, because popcorn is 99% margin for those guys at the at the theater. You know, Google will make 50 cents, and I'll save a buck. Right, everyone's a winner. So, you know, I hope that's going to happen. If that happens, and Google's still in the, if that is true, I, I don't know for a fact that that is, but if that is true, then we're still in the second or third inning for for you for for Google. Now, if I'm right, that means. You know, Google could be the most valuable company. You know, the implication is that Google is the most valuable company so far in history, because you know we could still be in the second or third inning of YouTube. We could still be in the second or third inning of mobile. Think about mobile. What if what if you opt in to say, hey, send me coupons, and you're walking past a Starbucks, and it's two o'clock in the afternoon. There's no one in that Starbucks. And they send you a coupon because you're within 100 yards of it. Come in. You know, we'll give you like 50 cents off a grande, whatever. Okay. The material cost for coffee and tea are incrementally like 35 cents for even the largest drink of Vente, or maybe like 40 cents. It's nothing. Okay, you save a buck, and they earn like two or three bucks that they wouldn't have earned anyways, right? And and that's not even there yet. So maybe I'm wrong, and but I just see it. What can be done? And I'm, I'm thinking I'm excited. Forget about being a shareholder. I'm excited about being a consumer. Right? And that's that's great. If you, I mean, one of the reasons why I love Costco is. That, I'm excited every time I go to Costco because there's I'm gonna get some kind of good deal, right? That's that's a great franchise to have. Free samples of 
Even that. <laughs> right. Yeah. What's your outlook on the U.S. economy? I have no idea in the short term. In the long run, I'm wildly optimistic. Um, I mean, there's just so many things that make our lives better. Five years ago, no one ever heard of an iPad. How many people have a tablet here? They're wonderful devices, right? I was just on the Google campus, and I'm thinking about the driverless car, and how wonderful would a driverless car be the, if it works, which I assume it will, and it's going to take a long time. I mean, it probably won't affect me. It will affect you guys more because you're younger than me. But think about the number of people who die in this country. Forget about the number of people injured, but just the number of people who die from auto accidents. 33,000 people. Um, what, will go, what will that go down to? That's like 20, maybe 20,000 lives saved a year. You know, that'd be wonderful. All that free time it frees up. You don't have to drive. You just, and that, you, know, you just spend time on Facebook or Google, right? <laughs> uh, uh, the, the amount of energy savings from that, if you, if you, if you, if everyone's in a driverless car, you can draft the cars next to each other, just like a bicycle, bicycling team. You can save serious amount of fuels from doing that. So there's just winners all around when they get this driverless car thing. And that's going to happen, and it's, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. So I'm, I'm wildly optimistic on, on the long-term um, progress of not just America, but of the world. Yes? No, I was going to ask pretty much the same question. Oh. So uh, do you think the S&P will go up next year? Because uh, uh, I can't put the money in your fund anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to so yeah. do the S&P, right? Uh, uh, well, the question is, what's the S&P worth? So before you make an investment, you have to ask yourself, what's the S&P worth? And so I think next year the estimates are for 120 bucks, maybe 115. Uh, year plus one. Okay, 122, 123. What's the S&P trading at today? So someone do the math. What's the PE of that? It's like 15, right? I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. I'm not, you know. 14.2. Yeah. Okay, 14.2. So. The average PE over a long period of time is 16-ish, 14.2 to 16. Is that enough margin of safety for some people? Maybe. If your time frame is long enough, certainly. But to me, in my range, that's very valuable. So I've been telling a lot of people, and this is just my opinion, I certainly can be wrong, and I would, certainly would not be surprised if the next move up of the market was up another 20 or 30%. But this certainly is not cheap. I'm not saying it's expensive, because at 14 point two, it's not, but it's certainly not cheap. I mean, would you buy a stock if it was worth 16? Would you buy it at 14.2? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, but you, in general, you'd rather buy it at 12, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'd rather, I'd rather wait until 12. I'd rather wait for until this goes to 14. To buy that. So I mean, just think about it. So in the in the depths of February 2009. The depths of the last bear market, the S&P briefly touched like six, I'm making this number up, it's a random moment, 625. So would you buy America at six times earnings? Well, the, you know, the S&P 500 six times earnings? Uh, well, the thing is, you didn't know that in 2013 it was going to earn 123 bucks. But if you assume that America was basically okay, then eventually it would earn 120 bucks sometime in your lifetime. Well, within a reasonable short period, I guess five years is a short period. Actually, six years. Six years out, you can buy a claim for 123 bucks going to seven percent a year. You can do that all day long. Right? So your number is not 17, but it has a 14 in the front. Of it. And it, it, it will happen too. I, it, the, you know, everyone has asked me. You know, they, they hear that I pick stocks for a living, and they say, um, you know, what do you think is going to happen? I said I can only guarantee, guarantee you two things. I can guarantee you that there's going to be a bear market, right? I can't tell you why, and I can't tell you when, but it always happens. <laughs> People always get scared. You know, but we could, it could be a long time between 
pain in the stomach. Yeah. So uh, our group is working on energy utilities. So uh -huh. I'm interested in knowing if you um, do any investing in that area, and also if you um, just if you have any ideas or thoughts about where to invest that industry you're going. We're debating um, selling some of our. Some of Are you talking about oil exploration? Well, I mean, it's a huge industry, and there's some right. energy utilities cover right. so much. Right now, we own um, an integrated oil. Uh, we have a farm in and then four kind of. Yeah. Uh, well, I personally interested. I, I personally am interested in Chevron and Exxon because they're trading at nine or ten times earnings. I don't know anything about them right. except for the valuation. Um, uh, I, I really can't. I mean, that valuation is obviously where I be, and they're not going to go bankrupt, obviously. I, I would look at that. Uh, the utilities, electric utilities, um, you know, it's, it, the rates are going to be capped, so it's just a bond. So it's, it's a matter of price. Uh, my guess is that because everyone's diving for yield, there's not a lot of long term potential in utilities. But going back to the, the Shell, the um, Chevron, and, and mm -hmm. the oil, um, the most important question to me, just taking a, a, a very quick look at, at something like Exxon, it's like they're spending like 30 billion on CapEx buy new fields and new sources of energy, replace the inventory that they lost. What's the return on capital of that incremental new investment? So I, I don't know. And that's right. the question I, I would ask. Well, I think we, you know, we feel like Chevron is strong. We're looking at Exxon and some of the other big um, companies possibly purchase. But I think the difficult thing to figure out, and this is the same with all stocks, but yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're continuing to make money. But are they making enough that it's really worth it? Or are they really at the top, almost at the peak of where they're going? You know, and I think that's what we're well, there's a lot of dynamics. I mean, there's certainly an elasticity to energy. So the cheaper the energy is, more of the use. That's why the energy always rebounds. Now, on the other hand, technology always works against energy on two different ways. I just mentioned a driverless car and drafting, things like that, or electric cars, or hybrids. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, you got a lot of people in India and China and Sub-Saharan Africa who want to drive, right? So... Right, it depends if you're looking you know, 30 years down the Right, but, but the one constant in human history in the last 150 years is that calories, or however you define energy, has always gotten cheaper. So the other thing about energy is like, technology is, no one heard of shell fracking, no outsider heard of shell fracking in 2008. And everyone was expecting the green revolution with solar and wind. The energy revolution happened in North Dakota and Eastern Pennsylvania with the shell fracking, right? There's, you, there are no unemployed people in North Dakota. Right? They're all working on the oil fields or servicing the, the people who work on the oil fields. The, they have the lowest unemployment in the United States. They're producing more oil in Alaska, I mean more oil in North Dakota than they are in Alaska. They're helping us become less energy dependent than you know, on, on the <coughs> Middle East. I mean, we're still not going to get out of the Middle East, but, but it just, there's, there's so many, there's just so much upside from an, I'm not talking from an environmental point of view, that's a different debate, but, but from an economic point of view, cheaper energy, more jobs in the U.S., more manufacturing jobs in the U.S. It improves our trade balance, it improves our currency, it improves our flexibility. So you, you just don't know what's going to happen. In general, energy does go, if we get in a war in the Middle East, then energy is going to spike. Okay? But over a long period, energy always comes down in price, at least in the last 150 years. Well, and then just to follow up to that, with the like, fracking, and that it's economically great, but maybe um, could have very serious environmental implications in the future that we don't know about yet. Um, do you ever like anything like that? Yeah, you have to you have to be concerned because even if things get believe it or not things get blown out of proportion in the media. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> so you can you can spin a story and that's it, right? I mean you know that's what's going on in no northern New York, right? Why is Eastern Pennsylvania pumping out stuff and not northern New York? It's because you yeah, have political. Okay, but even not like overblown issues. I mean, just in general, like other issues besides like fracking. I'd be concerned if I'm putting my future in, in Arizona about water, yeah, or Southern California, definitely. Or Vegas, yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Man's only been there for in, as a civilized force for the last hundred years. I mean, you didn't have a metropolis in Phoenix, drawing in Southern California, drawing all that water from the Colorado River for all those years, right? So what's going to happen? 50 years is nothing in terms of the human experience, right? So yeah, I'd be worried if you need that stuff. No one, no one else wants a sweet tart? 